This is episode 35 of Outlander Cast with Mary and Blake. People disappear all the time. Most are found, eventually. Disappearances, after all, have explanations. Usually. Cast with Mary and Blake. It's a podcast dedicated to the show Outlander on Stars. Happy Droughtlander. <laughs> We're helping you out. My name is Mary Larson. My name is Blake. And I am glad, glad, glad to be back, baby. I just, you know, hearing, hearing those bagpipes right now, it's it's music to my ears. <laughs> I'm missing me some Outlander. I'm not going to lie. You know, it's funny. We actually were having a discussion. Well, not you and I, but I was having a discussion with somebody on Twitter, and they were saying, what is the, what is the best soundtracks that are out right now for television and actually what are the best soundtracks at all what are the best scores for television of all time and one of the first things that came up was actually outlander so true and uh you know it's funny because it really is even though it's a brand new show bear mccreary has done an amazing job on this show and he was recognized for an emmy nomination uh for it as a matter of fact rightly so and he deserves it Mm -hmm. Um, but we are not here for bear mccreary neither are we here for the soundtrack of outlander My, my love what are we here for today We have the opportunity to speak with Meryl Davis, who is a huge powerhouse, of course, for Outlander. And of those of you who follow Outlander News and Outlander, the hashtag Outlander on Twitter, Meryl is an active Outlander force on Twitter, which is always an exciting thing when you get to talk to someone in like it wasn't even real life, but you get to talk to someone outside of 140 <laughs> characters, which which is nice. And I was extremely happy. I know Mary uh, looked up to Meryl in a lot of ways because you know she is a woman who is a producer in a largely male dominated field. And uh, I was extremely uh, happy and excited to speak with her because Meryl played a huge part in all things Star Trek. So I I was having a huge freak out, nerd out moment, uh, almost as much <laughs> as I had with Ron Moore uh, and Ira Stephen Bear, as a matter of fact. Because And uh, fun fact, here we go, she'll, she'll, she will tell you this later on in the interview, but they all worked together on Star Trek Deep Space Nine, uh, which is actually really cool when you start thinking about that uh, in those terms. I wonder if they have, each have tattoos that say bros for life or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> with like a Vulcan hand symbol. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Hand sign? I don't know. <laughs> hey, one of the fun things actually that you'll find out too from this interview is that Meryl actually called me out for my letter, my open and honest letter to stars. So if you have not read that yet, uh, it is on the blog. Um or you can actually listen to the episode, as a matter of fact. I think it was the episode prior to this. Uh, we I read it for the blog. Uh, and uh, and, and you know, uh, I'm sorry. I read it for the podcast from the blog as an episode of Outlander Cast. So if you have not gotten a chance to read it or listen to it, those are the avenues by which you can consume it. And I'm going to be making a rebuttal. Uh, you are going to be making a rebuttal. Watch yourself. <laughs> I'm going to stand up for stars. Well, my love, are you ready to get into the interview? Let's stop wasting everybody's time. Yes. All right, let's do it. Joining us today is Meryl Davis, an American producer who has many credits to her name in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Star Trek Voyager, Battlestar Galactica, and Carnival. But we all know her as the producing partner with Ron Moore's Tall Ship Productions and the woman who made Outlander and makes, made, makes, currently, and will continue to make Outlander run perfectly. Meryl, thank you so much for joining us here on Outlander Cast today. Happy to be here. So for those who don't know, what exactly do you do for Outlander? And really, what does your job entail? 
Uh, I'm an executive producer on Outlander and also Ron Moore's producing partner. And uh, I get asked this question quite a bit, and I've I've yet to figure out a great answer that kind of encompasses what I do since um, I have kind of an unusual job and every day is a little different. Um, while I am associated with the writer's office, I'm not a writer. I'm, I'm what you'd call a, a non-writing executive producer. So uh, my job covers kind of everything on the show. Um, Ron and I do tend to kind of split up duties and um, kind of divide and conquer. Um, I oversee a lot of the casting with the other producers and um, all the marketing and publicity uh, with uh, Stars and Sony. Um, I'm often on set, although we always have a creative producer on set as well. Um, and I'm in Scotland quite a bit. Um, I kind of oversee the writer's office in terms of just kind of the flow of information between them and, and the studio network and also the production. Um, I'm involved in writer's meetings, uh, production meetings, um, kind of liaison between the studio and the network um, and our show. So I kind of just do a little bit of everything, but I think that's why I like the job so much. I kind of like to have my hands in everything a little bit. So um, for me, it kind of keeps things fresh. Master of chaos, it sounds like. Yeah, yes, probably. <laughs> I like to say I uh, I do a lot of herding of cats. Oh, I love it. <laughs> so before you did, you were a producer on Outlander, before you did all of this, what did you do before even being any kind of a TV producer? Uh, well, I mean, my first job, I mean, I, I was a child, um, and then I grew up, and then um, I, after college, actually, my first job ever in the industry, because I... I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do something in television. Um, I worked as a producer or production assistant on Star Trek. I started on Star Trek Deep Space Nine and also worked on Star Trek Voyager and um, ended up working for the showrunner there, Rick Berman. And um, so I kind of, that was my first foray into the business. And from there, I just um, did a lot of things that kind of just worked my way up. So I always knew I wanted to work in television. I wasn't sure I wanted to be a producer when I started, but obviously that's kind of the path I've ended up on. So what ended up, what, like what made you want to be the pr pr a producer uh, per se? Like, is there something that happened uh, while you were working as a production assistant that said, I have to do this? Um, it's probably mostly that I'm a little nosy and I also like to kind of uh, keep, have a little hand in everything. I, I, I knew I didn't want to write per se um, or do that full time. Um, and I just think I, I kind of like bouncing around and not doing any one specific job. So, and because I worked for so many producers and then worked for the showrunner, I think I got a taste of that and, and like interacting with the marketing team and publicity and uh, the actors and the writers. I mean, I, I've really, I've kind of grown up working with the writer's office the most. So that's certainly the group that I have, um, you know, an affinity for, and, and, and I've always been close to, and obviously uh, with Ron and um, with us being producing partners, obviously I do tend to be in the writer's room quite a bit and work around the writers. So um, that that's just, I kind of fell into it quite honestly. I don't know if it was ever a decision I made. It just kind of happened. Now, you being a woman in this industry is... Sadly, still still slightly unique, but I think it's really awesome and empowering. And I wanted to know what it was like um, for you and and to see other women who have certain roles like this, who become essential figures in film all around. I think it's, I mean, I, I do think certainly lately there has been such a swell of uh, kind of acknowledgement of women in the industry and the, the need for parity with, with the men and and I'm totally in agreement with that. I mean, I do think we've all kind of, I think you kind of grow up and you just kind of see the behavior sometimes and just kind of the old boys club and just kind of go along with it. So I think you do it for so long that you start not to notice it, which maybe is, is the not so great thing about it. But I also, um, along the way, have, have been very fortunate that I've worked with a lot of people who have not kind of seen me as, you know, a female. Do you know what I mean? They've just seen me as equals. And certainly with working with Ron as long as I have, um, you know, I've never felt with him that um, he saw me as anything less than equal and a partner. And um, so I've been very lucky in that respect and also um, worked for some very um, uh, powerful and intelligent and respected producers on my way up, like Mary Howard um, at Star Trek, who was kind of my mentor. So I've been very lucky as I've kind of come up that I've 
I've had a lot of great examples and also um, a great working partner. So it sounds like, you no, know, obviously for me, I'm a huge Star Trek nerd, by the way, just just in case I actually have the plaque of the USS Enterprise in my studio. I'm looking at it. <laughs> nice. I'm looking at it right now as I speak to you. So it's like it's kind of like a oh, my God moment. Anyway, um, it sounds for me, I know that obviously you met Ron Moore through Star Trek. But can you talk about that for those of who for those who aren't the Star Trek nerds like myself? Can you talk about how you met and the process and how you how you became partners together? Well, when I started Star Trek um, as a PA, which is basically like the bottom of the rung, um, you're basically, we were on bicycles, we worked at Paramount. There were four of us that worked on two on Deep Space Nine and then two on Voyager. We all kind of shared a um, uh, a bullpen together, one big office, um, both shows. So um, we used to ride bicycles around the Paramount lot and put all of the scripts in our basket and go to each department. It was a pretty exciting first job, quite honestly. And kind of a crash course in the industry, although it was such a unique job in that, you know, every Star Trek series went seven seasons and it was kind of a given. Um, and so we never wrapped and uh, I didn't even know what the concept of wrap meant uh, <laughs> until I went on to something else because we just were continually year round. Um, but there was, when I first started there, a policy about PAs only be, being there a year because um, a PA that was there previously had had done something or there was some issues, so they kind of instituted this policy. So when I was getting close to my nine-month mark, I guess, um, I was obviously frantically looking around for another job at Star Trek, and Ron, uh, his assistant position opened. And at the time, I think Ron was a supervising producer. I don't remember what his level was, but um, I went over there just kind of grabbing that job. But um, it wasn't the most exciting job, um, I'm going to admit, because he was not running the show at the time, and um, he was in the writer's room quite a bit. So after about three months, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this, and I, I'm not sure he's forgiven me still to this day, but I left him to go work with his woman, Mary Howard, who was a line producer on Voyager. So um, I, I ditched Ron and then uh, went to work with her, then went to work for Rick Berman, and then wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do at that point because – you know, at Star Trek at that time, there wasn't a lot of upward mobility because um, people had been there for so long. So I actually left Rick um, to pursue a career as a professional soccer player because they had just started this women's professional soccer league. And um, I moved home, quit my job, moved home, um, tried to to try out for one of the teams, finally got invited to a tryout um, for the Boston team. And then two days before they were going to fly me out, I blew out my knee. Oh. So that was obviously a little devastating. Um, you know, I had knee surgery, rehabbed, and started to try to do it again, but just was my heart wasn't in it. So long story short, I moved back then and um, to L.A. and was doing a series of odd jobs and then ran into Ron at a party. And he was looking for an assistant. And I said, I'd, I'm happy to come with you, but I've I've done the whole assistant thing. I've been there. I'm looking to move on. And he said, come with me, you know, we'll do great things, you know, just come be my assistant and, and it won't be for long. And, um, I did that and that was carnival. And then, um, from then on we went to Battlestar and I've pretty much been with him ever since. So. Wow. Oh, see, you see, I had this beautiful follow-up question all lined up and then you dropped the bomb on me that you were almost a professional soccer player in Boston, no less, which is where <laughs> I'm from. Oh, nice. Where, where, what was that like? I, I mean, that must have been phenomenal, like just becoming a professional soccer player. Like, you were almost like Mia Hamm. Well, it would have been, I, I suppose, if I'd made it. Although it's funny, that story becomes kind of like a bit of a game of telephone because people then come up to me and go, I heard you were on the Olympic team. And I was like, no, no, not quite. Um, <laughs> not even close. It was great. I mean, I'm glad I did it. It was obviously a very tough year. Um, because getting an invite to try out was, was hard just because I'd been out of the soccer world for so long, um, after college. And, um, so it was very disappointing, but I'm, I still look back on that period, um, pretty fondly just because I'm just very proud of myself for actually going out and trying it. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, I was training with a lot of high school players and they were always like, wait a second, you moved to Los Angeles. You had a job, you were living on your own, and you moved back to live with your parents to play soccer? What? I'm like, one day you will understand. I know it doesn't seem that cool now, but one day you'll understand. <laughs> you will have a crisis one day, and it, it, <laughs> yeah, and exactly. it will happen. 
yeah. you go play badminton or something. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my really lame follow up question now. Mm-hmm. Does it, you know, obviously you, the writer's room in Outlander now includes Iris Stephen Bear and Ron Moore, all these Star Trek guys. And it, it's right. obviously it's a natural tree. But do you feel like you've kind of come full circle almost with Outlander and, and all these writers? And now you're kind of in charge of all of them. Well, I mean, no, I guess I've never really thought about it that way, um, and I'm sure they wouldn't want to think about it that way, but it's, it, I will say it's kind of, um, you know, I have so many friends and, and colleagues, actually, from that Star Trek era, and it, it's very thrilling to me, and Ron and I talk about this quite a bit, about how many of those writers actually have gone on and, and um, run their own shows and, and done so well creatively, and in some ways, it was kind of like um, a writing, directing, producing school. Do you know what I mean? So many people came out of there, and it was it's a very fond experience for those of us who work there. I mean, I have I was not a Star Trek fan when I first started there, which I think is one of the reasons I got hired, because I think they didn't want any like, crazy fans um, coming in and, and harassing the actors. But I now have a, a definite fondness for it, and... Um, it's just a really, it was a really wonderful period of my life and kind of a great starting off point. The next chapter, of course, became Outlander. Um, and I wanted to know, a lot of people, of course, know the story that you were able to tell Ron, hey, you got to look at this book. But I want to know, how did you first get a copy of Outlander in your hands? Well, Ron and I, um, while we were on Battlestar, were at Universal. And um, our writer's room was across the hall from... Um, Matt Roberts, his office, he used to work on Law and Order. And um, I actually, through a mutual friend of ours, started to play on the Law and Order softball team. <laughs> because <laughs> um, I obviously love sports and obviously Battlestar was, was in Vancouver. So, um, And then we became friendly and he one day recommended the books to me and said, you have to read these. He had read them as a reader in one of his first jobs and thought they were amazing but passed on them because... Uh, the company had wanted to do movies, and he was like, you can't do this as a movie. And um, he was like, you'll love these. Um, these could be amazing series, And and because uh, he knew I was looking for stuff to develop. So um, I read them, instantly loved them, read all the books uh, through, and then, you know, wanted to kind of recommend them to Ron, but at the time there was nothing like this on the air, and it just wasn't the right place, and we had Battlestar on. And, um, yeah, just one day at dinner I just, mentioned this is my passion project and uh fortunately ron um was also excited about it you know his wife is a big fan and um so i just kind of chased it like a dog with a bone and just you know we had a meeting with um the the gentleman who was the rights holder they wanted to do movies though so i said to ron as you know kind of like matt had said to me there's no way these these books can be turned into movies it just wouldn't do them justice so reluctantly we walked away and I just kind of kept checking in with them every once in a while just to see if they had changed their mind. And, um, and then one time, you know, when we checked in, they, they were open to it and it kind of took off from there. But certainly Matt, uh, was kind of the initial catalyst for that. And, um, and so it's kind of a talk about kind of a coming home or kind of a, a completed circle that he is on the show as well. So, yeah, we, we had actually talked to uh, Matt Rob. We had the pleasure of speaking with him uh, in season right after The Reckoning, as a matter of fact. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was quite proud of the fact that he had introduced Outlander to, to all of you guys, and uh, he, he would not let that go. So, um, Well, he should be. I mean, honestly, he is the reason we're here, because um, I would never have... I, I mean, I don't know if I would have come to it on my own. Maybe I would have, but uh, he really did kind of kick it all off, so... So you had this whole process of Matt introducing it to you, and then you reading it, falling madly in love with it, speaking with Ron about it eventually. Then you had the whole process of getting the rights from the movies and whatever. Like as you all as you just described, when you finally got the rights and you decided this is the show that we're going to make, obviously you pitched it to Stars and they accepted. But did you pitch it to anybody else uh, other than Stars? And then when you did pitch it to them, what was that pitch? By the way, I love how you say stars with the Boston accent. <laughs> I told you, I'm from Boston. What do That's you want me to awesome. do? <laughs> um, we did pitch it around town. Um, we pitched HBO, Showtime, AMC, the usual suspects. And um, But the reason we chose stars was they were the only network who, um, when we came in with our big stack of books, um, which we always kind of put on the table to be like, this is how much material we have to deal with. Um, they were the only ones that, A, read the book, and um, before we came in, all of them, Chris Albrecht, 
on down. Um, and also, um, we're the only ones who wanted us to follow the story, uh, love the story as much as we did. You know, everywhere else we went, um, they felt like, well, you're gonna, you guys are going to veer from the story, right? I mean, because, you know, you're not going to stick to the books, are you? I mean, we'd like you to, to kind of do something different. And, and we just knew we loved the story, and, and we wanted to be at a place that felt as passionately about the story as we did. And Stars is the only place that that felt that way to us and felt like a natural fit. And um, they've been wonderful to us. I mean, Sony and Stars, um, probably one of the best experiences we've ever had. Um, certainly, you know, Ron and I have been doing this for a long time, and uh, uh, no one is as supportive um, as they are or um, passionate about the material. Um, they're really in it just like we are, so we've been very lucky. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you, I'm, well, I'm glad that it's on – uh, these pre- it, that's on Stars or one of these premium networks. Was there ever a chance of it ever being on like a broadcast, like a network broadcast uh, network? Uh, or, or no, or, that was absolutely it? not. I mean, we would. I didn't even, you know, I said to Ron very early on, it wasn't even a thought. I mean, I just knew we could not do these books on one of those networks. The only way we could do it is on um, a cable network that was willing to kind of go to the places we needed to go to and um, would show everything. And we're not. We're certainly not. Um, creatively doing anything that we feel is gratuitous, but I feel like you have to go to certain places with these books or you can't really tell the story. So you talked about Stas and you talked about also um, uh, Sony, and then we, we also have Tall Ship Productions, which is what you run. Can you talk about the partnership between all of them and, and what are the mechanics like between all the different companies for those who don't understand what Sony does with you guys and what you're doing and, and what Stas does all together? Well, um, Tall Ship is obviously um, technically Ron's company um, that uh, we have, so uh, that's myself and Ron. And then um, we have an, a deal with Sony Television, so we everything we do is with Sony Television. They are always going to be our studios, so no matter what, how many shows we sell, um, we have a deal with them, so everything will be in association with them as our studio. So, um, but then Stars is our network, so. Um, when we uh, got the rights to the book and went to go take it out with Sony, you know, um, obviously Stars is where we ended up. So Stars is is um, in charge basically of all our domestic, uh, the domestic rights for Outlander, and Sony has all the international. Um, and also, for instance, Sony um, is in charge of all the DVDs and everything like that. Um, so it's a uh, they kind of both handle certain certain ends of things, but domestically, Stars is is in charge of that part of it. And um, yeah, I don't know if I answered the question fully. No, but. you did. I because even for me, and I have a podcast about this show, and it's still a little unclear about who does what and and why Sony's name is is at the end of the show and why Tall Ship is at the end of the show and and what they all do. I think it's it's complicated for just regular casual viewers, and I think it's important for everybody to know. Uh, is, I mean, it, for instance, you know, also Sony is in charge of selling the show internationally. We, Ron and I actually literally produce the show in association with um, Left Bank Productions, which is our UK um, production company. Um, but we are in charge of all the producing of it. But obviously, certainly Sony and Stars do have, um, certainly we send them scripts. They read and give notes. Same with cuts um, and casting. I mean, they have to approve whoever uh, we cast, but... You know, both of them have been hugely supportive, and I'm not sure, honestly, we've ever submitted a casting choice to them that they have said no to. So, um, but we're all kind of involved together. So, so you obviously. you you have essentially recreated and revitalized an entire film industry for Scotland uh, in, in, when you're producing a show like Outlander. And can you talk about that process and how the experience uh, in Scotland has worked for you so far? Well, it's been a great experience. I mean, it's so rare to be able to shoot a show in the place it actually takes place in. I mean, you know, we shot so many things in Vancouver, um, Vancouver for Portland or Vancouver for Los Angeles or wherever it may be. And it's uh, highly unusual to be able to afford to film in the place where the show actually takes place. Um, So we're very lucky that there was a great UK tax rebate for us and we could film there. We did have to kind of start from scratch. We have a great UK producer, David Brown, who kind of just revamp this entire kind of cellular phone factory for us. And, um, and yeah, we started up and it's, I think we're very, I mean, we're so thrilled to be able to, um, 
create jobs for people who previously had to go to Ireland or down to London to work and leave their families. And, you know, most of our crew, I would say probably 90% of our crew um, is from Scotland. So it's nice to be able to give them a chance to work um, at home for a change. So for us, that's been a great experience. And, and certainly for me, having always wanted to go to Scotland since reading these books, it's been a great experience. The travel is a little tough. I'm not going to lie. I um, I go back and forth quite often. I'm not quite sure my body is quite gotten <laughs> used to the time zones. I'm going back to Scotland actually in about a week and a half. And I just got here about a week ago. So it that is the only tough part, that eight hour time difference. The, the, um, the the plane ride is tough, but it, it's certainly a labor of love. I just a side note, I work for a local movie producer here in Rhode Island and um he's you know, his different projects that have taken place here have been able to give Rhode Islanders a lot of great jobs that they might have had to go out to California for or even New York. So it's really exciting to hear you talk like that and to also have seen just um what people have said about how Outlander has really been such an amazing opp- opportunity for anyone who wants to be a part of television and film out there. So just major props to you guys for making it possible to, to help get those people the jobs that they want. Oh, well, major props to the UK tax incentive for letting <laughs> us do that, too. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to take all the credit, but I mean, thankfully, it really did work out. It, I, like so many things on this show, I feel like in a weird way this was meant to be because so many great things have fallen into place for us. So, yeah, we're... Um, yeah, we feel very lucky. Now, of course, none of it would have happened. Absolutely none of it. Not even thanks to Matt Roberts. I'm talking about Diana. Nothing would have happened without Diana writing these novels to begin with. So yep. I wanted to know what your early conversations were like with her when you were talking about adapting the story for television. Well, Ron and I, very early in the process, um, went out to visit Diana in Scottsdale. And um, I was very nervous because I was certainly at that phase, definitely a little bit of a fangirl at that point because I, you know, had read the books. And, and honestly, I was not aware of, I knew of some of the online communities, but wasn't totally aware, but had read a lot about her. Um, and so it was a little daunting to go see her. And um, and so Ron spent and I spent some time with her. And it was exciting for me because I, I could certainly ask her a lot of the questions um, that I would wondered at reading the book, um, but under the guise of actually needing to know these things <laughs> <laughs> for the show and not as a fan. So um, it was very exciting, but it's funny how, how quickly your mind blanks when you're in those situations. So many questions you have, and then you're actually there with herself. And, um, and all of a sudden, it's just like you cannot remember a single thing that you wanted to talk about or bring up. But I got a lot of questions answer. And it was just kind of thrilling to meet her and, and to try to get a little insight into her, the way her brain works. She's, she's fascinating and uh, brilliant. And um, we've really appreciated her collaboration. I think, you know, it's hard, I'm sure, to see your books. Uh, you know, a lot of people have tried to adapt her books and not done very well. And I think I was very nervous because if she hadn't liked what we were doing, I, I I think she would have been very vocal about it because she is, I've said many times, she is not a shy violet. <laughs> um, but uh, so we've been so pleased that she's been very tickled by what we've done and um, has been very supportive. So uh, I've, I'm thrilled about that. Well, that must have been really special for her to know that you had the backing of Stas who wanted to tell her story. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, granted, there were some changes, and we can we can get into that later. But the, for the most part, you guys said we want to tell her story, and she must have been pretty tickled pink that that uh, you guys were were behind her in, in those ways. Well, I would imagine that, right? Well, I think she was a little weary when we first met her because, as I said, I mean, we were not the first people to come, um, you know, and try to adapt these books. Um, you know, the the only thing I could try to tell her, I mean, certainly Ron, you know, has a track record of writing very strong female characters and you know I'm very proud of the work that was done on Battlestar um but obviously this is completely different from Battlestar um so I don't know if if anyone worried oh the sci-fi guy is coming to do this kind of fantasy historical novel um but I I just tried to kind of let her know that you know how how much I cherish the books how much I love them um and certainly you know as a fan I wanted to see the books done in the right way as well. Like I would have been very upset if someone kind of tried to slash and burn them and, and, and not do them the right way. So, you know, I came in from that kind of, I love these books too. I, 
I promise you we will we will do right by them. So it's been announced that she is in fact writing an episode of season yep. two. Mm-hmm. How did that come about? And what, was, was she excited? Is she ready to like? I know J.K. Rowling is, is doing uh, the movie Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Is is is, it, is like she going under the same process uh, that J.K. would be going under for writing an episode of television of Outlander? Well, she's already done. I mean, we're, in fact, we're filming her episode as we speak. Um, she's on set with our writer producer Anne, and um, she, um, you know, we had asked her if she wanted to write an episode for the first season. Um, but she had said no. Um, I, I'm sure she was a little worried <laughs> that if we messed it up that she did not want to be involved. Um, but I think after she saw the first season and kind of realized, okay, we're doing a, a pretty good job, um, you know, it, it came up again the second season. And more kind of, I think, in a conversation, you know, we asked, assuming she might say no, but, um, and hoping maybe if we got season three that she would do it then, but she, it just happened to be that she had time in her schedule. So it worked out. So, and it worked out pretty quickly. I mean, unfortunately, um, you know, it was kind of late in the process and, and, but it, a window opened for her. So we brought her in and we had kind of broken the story already. Um, so we kind of walked her through it and, um, and yeah, I think she had a pretty good job doing the script. I mean, I, I wasn't sure if it would be a lot different from writing the book, but um, the writers assured me that um, certainly it's a different experience, certainly writing a novel and then trying to put something in a script form. But she did a great job, and I think she really enjoyed it. And she's um, out in Scotland, and I think she's getting a little taste of the weather (laughs) and long days we always complain about. Um, But I think she's really loving it and uh, gives her a good kind of um, uh, a good on-the-job experience and um, kind of is it, she's able to see kind of the, from soup to nuts, kind of the script at the beginning all the way through to the end. Yeah, she gets to see the process that you guys yeah. go through as writers adapting her work, but now she has to adapt her own work, which is, yes. I think that yes. must be pretty surreal. Um, and, you know, part of the adaptation of her work is finding the perfect Jamie and the perfect mm-hmm. Claire. Now, can you tell me what that pressure must have been like. I mean, there was a Claire watch. I mean, there were things going on that were fans were freaking out when they when they finally heard. What was that like for you? And what was that like for the production team? It was really tough. I mean, you know, even from the beginning, I said to Ron, um, you know, I felt like there were so many talented actresses out there that just didn't have this kind of role uh, for them. So I, in a weird way, I felt like, you know what, we'll find Claire. I mean, there's a lot of Claire's out there, but I thought we'll never find Jamie. I I said, I always joke that um, I said, Oh, he's probably going to be like the FedEx guy in Scotland. I mean, where is he? There's because we joke in the room that he's the King of men and the perfect man. And, um, and strangely we found him first. I mean, he was, um, we saw him on, you know, normally how casting goes is, um, we write up a description and talk to our casting director and pretty much tell her what we're looking for. Sometimes we will recommend if we, you know, there's certain characters and certain parts we've done that we, um, we have people in mind, prototypes. Um, and every once in a while we luck out and get that person. Mm-hmm. But, um, so he was in our casting kind of log and we went through and, um, and, uh, actually one of the other producers, um, Ira Bear and myself, we, we ended up Skyping with Sam, um, to kind of because we were going to have him do the scene over with some notes. I'm not quite sure why it was just the two of us. I think everyone else was too busy. Um, and just in talking to him on that day on that Skype call, I just was like, man, he's so charming. He's so jam-. he just kind of came alive on that Skype call. And um, so we found him very quickly. I mean, I was a little nervous to tell when we Ron and I called Diana when we were in London after we had kind of initially chosen him and, and cast him. And I was nervous because I thought he he's much better looking than I think Jamie is described in the books in some ways. Um, and I thought she might, uh, have an issue with that, but (laughs) she pretty much immediately after seeing him just said, Oh, he's Jamie. Um, so that actually worked out so quickly and so easily. Then we turned to Claire and it's like, we just could not find her. Um, we saw a lot of great actresses and, um, called a lot of people back and just could not find someone. And I remember, Ron and I were both sitting in our office in Scotland and we were about three weeks away from production and we were talking about what to do. And we had a couple actresses that we liked, but we weren't sure about. And, uh, Ron says, well, what do you think? Should we go for one of these ladies? And I just said, 
you know what, we can't, uh, it's just, we have to wait. I said, I know we might have to push production, but it, these parts are just too important. Like, if we don't get Jamie and Claire right, we're dead in the water. I mean, we might as well not even make this. And then, the, like, a day later, um, Tony Graffia, one of our writers, um, was kind of re-looking through all of our casting tapes, and we had so many Claire auditions. <laughs> and um, found Katrina kind of hidden somewhere, maybe in a place we hadn't looked or... Um, or just there were so many people and um, said, check this girl out, and we all did again, and just kind of immediately knew she was special and brought her in, and it just happened very quickly. I mean, she was announced September 11th, which is my birthday, and I think we started October 1st, so, I mean, it was was that close. So uh, we got very lucky. I mean, I'm so glad we waited, though, because that's, you know, they're so perfect for these roles. I'm not going to ask for any names or whatever that that's not important to me, but what is important to me was had you considered um, like, obviously uh, I think Sam and Kat, they were relatively unknown, I think to the wide, wide public um, before these roles. Was it important to you to find someone who was a fresh face or did you, were you originally intending to have someone with a little bit more star power? No, I, I was hoping we'd find someone with no baggage, as I call it, someone who wasn't, recognizable or you wouldn't you wouldn't be like oh I saw that person in that show do you know what I mean I, I was hoping we'd find someone new so they wouldn't be associated with something else so um luckily we did so I mean that was the hope and uh and yeah it just turned out that way as well so as it relates to the mechanics of the show I mean we were talking about how to pick Claire and Jamie and whatever but how, how do you pick your key components of the show like the directors or the cinematographers or or even the writers uh, for that matter yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of the writers, certainly Ron and I sat down originally and, um, you know, he brought up Ira Bear, which for me was kind of an unusual choice only because I love Ira and he's an amazing writer, but I do do tend to think of Ira more as the the sci-fi guy having come, obviously, you know, through Star Trek and the 4400. Um, But I was like, oh, that's a great choice because um, he wasn't a fan of the books or hadn't read them before. um, And... I think we did need kind of a mixture of people who had read them and not read them. Um, obviously, Matt was kind of a no-brainer because he was brought the material to us, was a great writer, and also was a fan of the books and, and a male, so it was nice to have a male fan of the books. Um, and then also, Ann Kenny, who I'd met through, um, uh, she and Matt had, had developed something with us, and she was a huge fan of the books, so um, I recommended to Ron that we hire her. And then Ron and I both knew Tony Graffia from Carnival, and we love her, and uh, I thought she'd be a great addition to the show, and she also had not heard of the book. So it was a nice combo of we wanted people who were big fans, um, Matt and Anne, and, but also people who weren't familiar with the material, Ira and Tony, um, because I think you need, you know, some of our greatest moments, I think, in um, on screen have come out of major arguments in the room. Um, between the fans and and the newbies. Um, And I think if we were all fans or we were all non-fans, I don't think we'd have the show we have today. Mm. And about the directors, is there there specific things that you look for in certain directors for certain episodes? Or is it, hey, whoever whoever is available? Well, no. I mean, (laughs) we're not picking people off the street. But, but, you know, we are having a little more challenging... um, situation when it comes to directors, we are a non-DGA show. Um, so, you know, we do get sometimes um, the ability to hire one DGA director like John Dahl, our, who kicked off the series last year, was DJ, but everyone else has been non-DJ. So it is a little um, challenging uh, to find directors because that limits the pool quite a bit. Um, you know, I I think the only area that I would say I'm a little disappointed in myself this year because um, I kind of lead up the directing charge is um, the lack of, of female uh, directors this year. You know, I think last year with Anna Forrester, we were so thrilled and, and she brought some great episodes. Um, I'd like to hopefully bring in more women if we get season three because I think it just adds variety and um and uh, just adds dimensions to the show. But we, I mean, for directors, we just try to go for the best people from the material. Um, you know, it's also challenging to find people sometimes because it's a long haul on our show. You know, the prep period is a month. The shooting period is a month. That's a long, two months is a long time sometimes for people to be in Scotland. Mm-hmm. So um, sometimes that's difficult. But as the show gains popularity, 
Um, you know, I think we will um, keep attracting unique talent, but I think we've been very lucky that we've gotten directors who come in and I take it as a good sign that they all want to come back. Yeah, we, you know, we've spoken with uh, Anna Forster as well, and she is an absolute delight. And I, yeah, she's I, wonderful. I, I can sit like her, her job in, in the, the episodes that she did was was phenomenal, and I consider her in the same level as those with you know as with Michelle McLaren and and, and yes. Mimi Leader, like just yep. powerhouses. And uh, it's not easy to find powerhouses like no, that. So. No. I understand where you're coming from, but uh, you know, you did mention Ira Bear, um, and I, I find that interesting because, you know, your last two episodes, I, I do want to talk about them. I absolutely adored them. I know Mary, I speak for her as well. She adored them too. But there are critics and supporters that have said that Outlander, you know, has definitely pushed the boundaries of television and story, uh, especially as it relates to those final two episodes. And Ira was the one who wrote those two episodes, or at least gave had, gave um, some con- consultation on them. Uh, I know he got credit for 15, um, but what's your reaction to those critics that say that you guys have pushed it a little too far? Well, I mean, you know, uh, I don't, we've actually pulled back from the book. If you've read the book at all. Um, I, I didn't, by the way. My my wife no, has. <laughs> well, if you read the book, you would realize we've actually pulled back from that quite a bit. Um, you know, and I, I just, all, all of all of our episodes, you know, have, I think, been done in a way that's not gratuitous, um, but essential to telling the story, and certainly with 15 and 16, and and certainly those were, all of the writers were involved in, in figuring out those stories, that we, we felt that it was important to show how far uh, this rape went with Jack and Sam, Jack and Sam, Jack and Jamie, <laughs> um, because it colors the rest of Jamie and Claire's life. He's such a big part of their life. And I think if you don't show the extent of that attack and uh, the psychology of it and how far Jack breaks Jamie down, I don't think you're doing justice to the rest of the story because, and certainly in season two, we'll see the repercussions of that. Um, But, you know, you can't sometimes shy away from those um, difficult moments. And once again, I do think we actually dealt with that um, in a way that I think was um, showed the brutality of it, but but wasn't uh, over the top. As Blake said, I've read the book. So as these scenes were happening, he was looking at me saying, are you serious? Is this really <laughs> happening? And I was like, buddy, you, you don't know. Like, yeah, this is like yeah. half of, oh, my gosh. Yeah. And I will tell you this, um, especially for people who hadn't read the books, and they don't understand the haunting pretty much. That's like how I can describe yeah. the rape. It's, it's, it haunts Jamie. Um, I was really, really impressed with the fact that it was male on male rape and that you were able to show it and it was scary and disgusting, but it also prompted conversation. Yeah. Um, because it's something that isn't really talked about on TV or really in novels, and yet it is something that happens in the world. And I think the, the psychology, um, I, I'm, I'm just being honest. We had we talked about this on our podcast. My mom didn't understand no, why. No, no. It's true. Oh, why? Don't go here. Don't well, do it. Why yeah. Jamie was um, oh. physically pleased. My mom couldn't understand oh, right. that, yeah. and yeah. she was like, "Well, he, what happened? Why? Why did he like that? What ended uh. up going on?" And I and I said, "Gosh, if my mom didn't get this." How many other people need these conversations and need to understand different things about um, terrible situations like this? So we, it, I wanted to applaud you because um, you did. You were able to show the the terrifying event, of course, very very well. But as I said, it also prompted um, conversations. So well, I think that for us was the one of the more important points of that scene because I think Jamie's shame. Um, shame in the aftermath um, is mostly tied up. I mean, obviously he was um, assaulted and I think anyone in that situation would feel that way. Um, but, but I think because he um, derived eventually, and I don't know if pleasure is the right yeah, word. I'm but, like um, taking it back now. Yeah. Yes. But, um, but um, you know, there were certain male functions that just you can't control. And I mean, I don't know this uh, personally since I'm not a male, but I mean, there are certain things that, I mean, just from a biological standpoint, you can't control. And I think it was important to show that because, you know, that that probably is very realistic in, unfortunately, these type of cases. And we don't see a lot of male rape. It isn't, um, it isn't 
uh, highlighted as much as obviously female rape is. And I think it is important um, that we show that because it, it did happen during that time and certainly probably does happen even today. And, um, and it's just as devastating for a man as, as, as it is for a woman. I mean, it's, you know, being assaulted in that way is, is a horrible experience. So, but I think once again, we have to show that because I think it, it colors everything Jamie does moving forward. That being said, were the final two episodes the biggest challenge of season, season one for you? Um, every, I'm, I will admit every block we do, and by block, I mean that we always do two, film two episodes at a time and we cross shoot. So we, you know, film things out of order. Um, every, every block is, seems to be tougher than the last one, just logistically and weather wise and everything. But certainly I think that was one of the more challenging blocks, um, emotionally, um, and material wise. I mean, you know, Ira was on set for those, uh, for those episodes, as was I. And, um, you know, we have a very happy set normally. Um, You know, it's the people, you know, work hard, but they also play hard and everyone has a good time with each other. And, and, and um, it's just a very lovely set. And um, this was a very hard week, which, because we pretty much shot those scenes, um, the rape scenes and everything in the um, Wentworth prison cell over one week. And um, it was one of the more depressing weeks I've had on set. It was just tough. We just sat there. I mean, at one point I just said to Ira, uh, you know, it's like, hug me. Um, It was just like, you know, there wasn't a lot of laughing. I think instinctively, like I talked to Anna Forrester originally before we started the block about maybe we should have a conversation with the crew about, you know, being respectful of the actors, certainly of Tobias and Sam, and this was difficult and, you know, there was going to be nudity and all this stuff and, and some difficult material. Um, and we ended up not doing that because we kind of realized the crew was already very respectful and, and they're so protective of the actors. And I, they just instinctively kind of knew what the actors needed and gave them their space. But it was still a very quiet, subdued set that day or those days. And, um, you know, I applaud Tobias and Sam. They just they really went there and um, it was tough. But um those were emotionally, and um, I think, our toughest episodes. But um, certainly every, every block we do is challenging um, and just gets more so. And, and certainly as we get into the second season, it did. So without getting into spoiler territory, uh, you, you talked about some big challenges of season one. Uh, but without getting into spoiler territory, what, what, would, what is the biggest challenge you've seen so far for season two? And, and what are you most excited to put on screen for season two? Uh, I say the biggest challenge for season two, and obviously as even looking forward with the hopes that we get subsequent seasons, is, um, you know, we refer to this show as a traveling show. Uh, it does not have, we do not have stand what we call standing sets, which are sets that are up all the time that we go back to. I mean, Lollybrock is the only thing that comes close to that, and those are sets that we take down and kind of push off in the storage and then bring back whenever we need them. But, um, you know, certainly for our, our production, or our um uh, the art department and the costume department and props and everyone else, we are constantly doing new stuff. So it's constantly building new sets, new costumes, um, and just keeps moving as we go. So it's a constant uh, uh, challenge for us to stay on schedule, make our days. Um, also, the weather is very tough. I mean, we got very lucky last year. Everyone said, oh, this is the warmest winter we've had, which <laughs> I was like, that's so depressing because I'm freezing. Um, and this year has been, we, we actually have been lucky up until this point and actually um, ended up shooting our episodes out of order um, because we assumed that um, certain episodes would have a lot of exteriors. Um, and now we're coming into the really bad weather. I mean, I think it started to snow today there. It's you know, shooting into the winter is tough also because it gets dark at 4.30 there. And, um, you know, so, um, but I would say the logistics, the the weather is always tough and the um, constantly building, taking down of the sets and costumes. Um, it's a challenging show. I mean, certainly the hardest show I've ever worked on. Yeah, I know you're, you're shooting in Scotland, but I also, it's been announced, obviously, so it's not a spoiler, but you were shooting in Prague and you were doing all these different things. Can you tell the difference? What are the differences between shooting in, in a place like Prague and then going back to Scotland again? 
Uh, well, Prague was about 88 degrees when we shot there. <laughs> I actually, so, I mean, there's that difference. Um, but also, we just, you know, we were only in Prague, I think, a week filming. And um, it actually was a lovely break for the crew to go. And, and the weather was nice. And we actually saw people had limbs because normally you can't see people's arms and legs because people have so many clothes on. Um, but um, the different, I mean, I'm not sure there's a huge difference except that we were in another country. Um, you know, our days are are pretty much the same no matter where we are and, and obviously the weather was a little bit different but I think it was exciting for us we've been on the road a little bit more this year um, and while logistically for uh, the production team that's very tough I think our crew actually really enjoys it um, and also I love being inside, shooting inside on our sets because it's much warmer, but I find I'm in the minority. Most of our crew, after a couple of days on set, starts to get a little antsy to get back outside. So um, I think the variety really helps, certainly for them, that's not the monotony of, of the same sets every day. I appreciate that. I tell Blake all the time, I get cabin fever here in Rhode Island. It gets <laughs> exactly. pretty pretty uh, snowy in the winter, so <laughs> we're preparing for that already. Um, earlier in our conversation, we talked about your first time meeting Diana. And of course, you've had many, many conversations with her since then. I wanted to know, does Diana share things with you about how she plans on ending the books? I have, you know, I think she forgets, but she actually shared the ending of the book with me, Sam, and Ron. Um, so at first, I wasn't sure I wanted to read it, but then I was like, well, okay. <laughs> um, so I did. Um, I like asking things all the time. I mean, I think the great thing about Diana is she's um, she is just uh, a wealth of information. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's for me as a fan um, – there's nothing better than if we have a question in the writer's room about something, um, emailing Diana to ask if she can explain it to us. Do you know what I mean? You so rarely get that experience yeah. as a reader of a book um, to have that person uh, be able to answer your questions. And there, I mean, I've read the book so many times, but there are still so many things I have questions about. And it's it's really a wonderful experience. And, um, and for me, just uh, I feel very lucky to be able to pick her brain. So... Um, and she's been so generous with our time, her time with us. So, um, yeah, that's, I mean, great. I mean, we still have so many questions about time travel that we've asked her that I'm not sure we've cleared up, but, um, <laughs> we'll let that go. <laughs> Meryl, we have this great connection, you and I, uh, obviously for the whole Boston thing. And so <laughs> I'm I, right. you're and, going my, what? <laughs> and my brother's name is Blake. So. Oh, so, okay. So now this is an even more important reason. <laughs> For you to do me a huge solid here, all right, a huge solid. All I want you to do is just one small thing. Just tell me how it ends. So that way I can, we, I can get the scoop and we can nope. be famous. How's that sound? No way. Sorry. <laughs> um, with, uh, although, I'm obviously, obviously, I'm kidding. But uh, it, you've, you have talked with her about the end of the book. And with that in mind, have you planned, for, planned out that for the show? Uh, do you intend on... Uh, sticking to the timeline of the things that she's created? Like, are you going to do a season per book? Or how do you intend, if you plan on ending the show on your own terms, do you intend on doing it the way that she's laid it out? Well, this is a kind of a high-class problem to have. I hope we have that problem um, or, uh, you know, figuring that out. I, I do think we kind of plan to do a season of book if we can continue. Um, and um, there was one small thing we kind of incorporated early on um, that related to the end of the book. Um but obviously I can't tell you what that is. Mm -hmm. But um, but other than that, I mean, um, obviously that is so far in the future that it doesn't really touch what we're doing now. I mean, like I said, there are a couple things, and certainly the benefit of having read these books is there are so many things that kind of connect to things in the future um, that it's sometimes helpful. And, and quite honestly, sometimes we forget about those things, even having read the books, um, that you do try to plant in earlier. You know you can't do something because Claire does something in, the few, in book six or something. But, but, you know, even Diana has said, I think a lot of people say to her, you're writing book nine. How does that affect how does the show affect your writing? And she's like, it doesn't at all because it's so far. I mean, you know, Jamie and Claire are, are quite advanced in age um, from where we are now then. And so it doesn't really affect us that much. Wow. All right. So Meryl, I always have the pleasure of asking the, the last and final question to every one of our interviewees. And it's the most important question of the interview. Uh, and that is, are you team Frank or are you team Jamie? Oh, I'm both. I mean, I quite honestly, I really am both. I, I, 
I mean, I'm pretty much team Jamie, obviously, but I have a, a love of Frank. I mean, I love of show Frank. Let me put it that way. I um, <laughs> yes. I like book Frank, but I'm not the way I like uh, show Frank. But it's also because I adore Tobias Menzies. He's adorable. And, um, and also, I think he's done so much with that character. And I think we worked very hard to make it a connection between uh, Claire and Frank um, early on because we kind of felt like other, if you don't do that and if you don't feel like there's a connection between Claire and Frank, then there's really no love triangle. It's like you won't root for her to go back. You'll just root for her to stay with Jamie, which I think you do anyway. But but I think, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of people have been maybe slightly negative about um, the amount of Frank we've shown. But um, I, I just think it just adds the adds to the show and gives it a well-rounded quality because otherwise – you know, you'll never feel like she's torn, and she should be. She, I, she had a true love of Frank. It might not have been her soulmate like Jamie, but I think um, he was a good man or is a good man. And um, so I think, you know, um, I, I appreciate Frank. So probably Team Jamie, but I, I really am kind of partly Team Frank as well. Well, I just wanted to say, you know, coming from me as my experience is just a show watcher, I'm so happy that you guys made the, the, the artistic choice uh, of including more Frank, and uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm absolutely 100% positive that you don't remember this, but you and I actually had the pleasure of meeting at the New York premiere for season 1B, and I, and I actually asked you a couple of questions and all that other stuff, but while I was there, the reason why I bring this up is because I actually told Sam to his face, dude, I'm, I'm team Frank, and I just oh, need okay. you to know that, and, okay. uh, and uh, he... he he was a little disappointed in me. <laughs> oh, uh, but you know what? I'm sure you're in the minority there, so I'm sure he has quite a few, uh, you know, uh, Team Jamie supporters. So I've said it a thousand times. I I, I feel like I'm Frank. I, I I'm the married guy, and it would of course it would happen that my wife would leave me for a strapping young <laughs> no. Scottish young man, and and I, I feel like it's like I'm Team Married Guy. You know, I got to support Frank yeah. in that way. I hear you. <laughs> Thanks, good guy. Did nothing wrong. So, <laughs> well, uh, Meryl, that does it for the, what the portion that will appear on the podcast. Uh, so, what we'll do now is we'll just kind of shoot the breeze a little bit, and do, we'll do the uh, the lightning round of questions, and then and that'll be it. Is okay, that fair? And can I just say one thing? I mean, I feel like lately there's been so much talk on the lack of promotion. I saw your letter, Blake, um, to <laughs> stars, uh, which I don't totally agree with, but um, I just would love to be able though to address I know people are kind of wondering why it's been so long since they've seen stuff and and um you know I guess I want people to know that certainly it's not um from a lack of wanting to show um the fans or keep them engaged and you know I think Stars and Sony are, are trying very hard to, with this long drought lander that we have it's quite a bit of time since between seasons but you know, some of this is also because it takes the show so long to um, go from script to through the post-production process. I mean, we uh, started shooting in May, and we still don't have a finished episode yet through post-production. So that's seven months, I think. So I just want people to understand and also um, that, you know, um, we understand people are hungry for it, but uh, certainly are all trying and hope to get people material soon. So, um don't want people to be upset, but also don't uh, want the brunt of this anger to be at, at Sony or Stars, who are, are trying hard to kind of, uh, you know, uh, balance their jobs and also the fan uh, attention and, and uh, desire to see more stuff. Well, first of all, let me say thank you very much. I, I am completely 100% honored that you actually saw my letter, <laughs> took the time to read it. It was relatively long. Um, and obviously, I mean, I do stand by what I said, but I wanted to say... Um, I think people, I think you've already touched on it, but I want to reiterate it and, and, and I want to let you know that just people love your product and they just right. want, they, they can't wait to consume it. And, and I'm one of them. Um, I, I really enjoy the show and I, I think that's, that's why there's a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of anger dealing with it because people just want more and in, right. in, in whatever fashion, whether it's a podcast or if, if it's a, I mean, if it's as nerdy as like a graphic novel or whatever, if it's a coloring book. I mean, people are clamoring for it. I mean, and that's a good thing too, obviously. Um, but I, yeah, thank you very much for reading what I had to write. I, I'm well, really someone actually, for, I will admit, someone forwarded it to me. But on that, I just the problem is there's only so many of us who work on the show that oversee some of the stuff, and you know, anything that kind of needs approval probably goes through me and Ron. And um, it's just there's we're trying so hard to get this show out, and the actors are so busy on the show. You know, they do quite a bit of promotion, but 
they're exhausted, quite honestly. And, um, and it's just, there's just not enough time in the day. So I get it. I mean, I hear it, but I do feel like there's been a lot of flack about stars lately and Sony. And I feel like that's maybe not fair in that, you know, they're really trying hard. And also it's such a long time before the show airs. They just, you know, um, if they put out so much material early, they wouldn't have a lot left to show. But it's also because, you know, a lot of this falls on the production. We don't have as much done as, as, uh, as th- you know, they could show more material earlier if we had were done earlier, but we're, we're quite honestly not. So, um, and a lot of times we deal with spoilers. So I get it. And listen, we'd love to show more stuff out there, but I just want to make sure that, um, you know, people understand that it's not a deliberate attempt to, anger people and, and hopefully we'll get stuff out soon but no I, I appreciate where you're coming from and, and that's the beauty of i mean we maybe we may not be getting something that's officially stars but we all have our own communities here with like the podcasts that i've talked about the blogs that we've talked about the tumblers the, the gifts and the memes all that stuff we i think a lot of people are are, are taking it um taking their own way of, of getting right. through this drought lander which is beautiful and uh you know, I was reading an article that J.J. Abrams just did for Star Wars, and he did one for Entertainment Weekly, and he was saying, we want to give people a taste. We want to give them an appetizer, but we don't want them to be full on yeah. what we're trying to do. And so, I mean, I can always appreciate what you guys are trying to do. And either, one, you don't have it completed, or two, you, you just don't want to give it all away quite yet. You want the story to be told the way it needs to be told. So I, I can appreciate that. Well, hopefully we're starting, you know, it's not too far away now, but, uh, you know, hopefully the premiere date will be here before we know it and, uh, and, uh, everyone will be satisfied. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so uh, if, is, if it's okay with you, yep. I mean, if you still want to continue to address this, I, I will be nope. more than happy to do it, but if we can, nope. we want to go into the lightning round. We could do that sure. if you'd like. I'm glad she doesn't hate you yet, Blake. I know. <laughs> when he wrote that, <laughs> well, he wrote? I have to, I have to stick up for my star's brethren and, um, because I really do think they get the brunt of this sometimes, and mm-hmm. uh, not not always fair. But uh, but everyone has a right to express their opinions. Certainly, <laughs> he, he wrote that, and I went, "Whoa, um, that is." <laughs> I won't sure. forget the Boston connection, though. Even the, the the small as small as it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, well, Meryl, thank you again. Thank you. You've done us a great honor. I I'm so appreciative that you took the time. It's unbelievable. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Whew. that was awesome. <laughs> she is great, and. and and I need I need to reiterate this point. I am actually really, truly honored that she read my letter. The fact that it got all the way up to production staff, it got all the way up to stars brass. Like, how uh, humbling is that? And I know she called me out, and it was a little embarrassing at first, but you know what? Who am I? Who am I to, you know, like, what, what, do, I, what, do, what do I say to that, and what does whatever I say matter in any respect to what they are doing in this Hmm. large world. Well, here's what I'm going to tell you. When Blake wrote this first uh, blog post, they went went through a few edits because I got to look at it and Blake wasn't as necessarily (laughs) kind as he should be with his choice. I wasn't as diplomatic. I will say that. And even still, it's a little bit of a tough read sometimes if you're on the side of stars. So I am glad someone read this because I told him, I said, someone could read this and be a little upset with you or a little feelings hurt. And I think that people need to understand that your comments, whether it's a blog or if it's a tweet, people do see them. Mm -hmm. And people... It, it's tough because, of course, Blake's blog, I, I'm so happy that you wrote it. And I think that what you said has a lot of valid points and you do need to express your feelings. But but you were able to do that in a kind manner. And I just really want to make a note that all of you who are in this Outlander fandom, we're all in this together. Mm-hmm. Us, Meryl, Stars, Ron, Kat, Sam, everybody. We're all in this together. So we're do all not... in this together. Sorry, Zach Efron. <laughs> <laughs> Can't believe I just referenced but that it's, movie. It's, it's so easy when when you get to hide behind a computer or behind a smartphone to kind of take off a... Uh, you know, to show, show that well, you're disappointed. Well, let me let me say this. There are those that do hide behind smartphones, and there are those that do hide behind the anonymity. You like that? I just got that word very easily. The anonymity 
of computer in the internets and in the interwebs. There are those, though, that do have valid criticisms, and I am one of them. I have no, a valid I criticism, and I stand by. Even though Meryl did call me out, I do stand by. And there are a lot of fans out there that do stand by their words very very vocally and very proud. Yeah, and all I'm saying is that make sure what you do say, you could say to someone's face. Because especially people like Meryl or the people who work for Stars or anyone who honestly works with Outlander, they're real people. They so are real if people. you don't think that you could say that to their face or say it to them over a microphone, then maybe you need to think about to say it in a different way. Well, I think that's something that is worthy of talking about real quick. It's easy to forget that you like right you're right my love that they are real people. They they're they're just like you and I. They we all put our pants on in the morning, right? It's easy to it's easy to think of someone like Meryl Davis or Ron Moore or you know even more um, distinctly and and more appropriately stars as this big giant corporation. They're they're nameless, they're faceless. You, you know, perhaps if you're involved in the television world, you know their CEO Chris Albrecht, uh, and, and and perhaps you view them as just this automaton that 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 goes out there, but. The people that run those organizations are, in fact, human, and I think that they do try. Uh, do they deserve a little bit more leeway? Probably. But then again, as I said in the letter, they finally, and and I and in, re, and I need to reinstate this. They finally have something that is worthy of people's consumption in Outlander. And and yes, they are a relatively new network, that is, for stars. And yes, they are a relatively new show for Outlander. But they need to do right by the people. And I, I think they're trending towards that way. That you, uh, we're, see, we're starting to see more engagement with, with uh, the listeners and, and the viewers and the consumers. That, however, does not mean they don't have a long way to go. And uh, even though even though they are trying, they do have a little bit more to go to to reach the levels that not only we, the consumers, deserve, but that the show Outlander deserves. Again, it's a great it's 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 a good encroaching great series. And Meryl and Ron have put together this series with, out of the brainchild of their talent, and they are fully deserving of, of all the praise. Outlander needs to step it up a little bit more. Do they deserve a little bit more love? Do, we, do they deserve more leeway? Yes, but they got to step it up too. And it's okay to be hot on them, but just remember that they are, in fact, people. They're not just a faceless corporation. So I think that's one of the big things we have to take out of this out of this interview and and out of my letter as well. And I and I hate to be self self serving and, and keep mentioning it, but is it's it's a legitimate it's a legit legitimate thing it's a legitimate cause to stand behind yes <laughs> <laughs> great analysis my love <laughs> thanks for I, letting me hang i feel <laughs> i was on my soapbox for a little while now you were <laughs> well I, you know th- this interview would not be possible obviously without the help of some people and we want to thank the people at the outlander cast blog where we actually got word that we were interviewing Meryl and uh, we were interviewing her on the same day that uh, we had to actually do the interview and uh, we put out a help SOS uh, signal to all the writers on the Outlander cast blog if you haven't got a chance go to outlandercast.com click on the little right the little button on the right hand side that says blog and you can check out all the fantastic articles as well as news uh, each and every single day that comes up regarding outlander we are a news source now imagine that um and i wanted to thank all the writers on there and you all know who you are but i will in fact say thank you to ann and sarah and our editor-in-chief kendra janet john ashley barb denise carolyn melissa aaron and Paige. none of this was possible without you guys you guys rock and uh, I'm so happy uh, that you're a part of our team. And as a matter of fact, we also have something special to announce about the blog uh, as well. You did hear just right now at the interview with Meryl Davis, and thank you for listening. But we also did about 10 or 11 questions with Meryl Davis that will be specifically on the blog, the Outlander cast blog. And it's about 10 questions about getting to know Meryl. And some of the questions would be, what's her favorite uh, television show currently on TV. What's her favorite movie? What's her guilty pleasure? And so on and so forth. So the more you want to learn about Meryl Davis, please go to the Outlander cast 
blog. Uh, again, you can reach it via OutlanderCast. Just go to the top right-hand corner, hit the little tab that says blog, and you'll be able to read it there. I think it will be out probably a day or two after this podcast is published. Uh, do you think that'd be a fair timeline, my love? I agree. I think so as well. So uh, do you have anything else to add to this fantastic episode? I do not. I'm just excited to continue the conversation. I know. Me too. All right. Let's close it out. Let us know what you think about this interview. Please reach us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Our handles are OutlanderCast. And if the social media isn't enough for you, you can always get us at OutlanderCast at gmail.com. Head on over to our website, OutlanderCast.com, for all previous interviews, episodes. Heck, do yourself a favor. Do a rewatch. Do a rewatch in December. It's a perfect series to watch in December. Do a rewatch and a re-listen Ooh, to our podcast. I like that idea. And if you want to continue to support OutlanderCast, you can do so in many ways. And one way you can do that is go to OutlanderCast.com and click on the little button that says support in the top right-hand corner of the webpage. And there are plenty of ways to support us. One of them is you can go on Patreon and donate a dollar or two dollars. Uh, or you can do PayPal and have, if you don't want the commitment, of a, of a monthly donation you can do a one-time donation but you know what the money and everything you know that's important and it helps ke- keep this podcast free but the most important thing you can do for this podcast is tell a friend that we exist if we provide a good enough value for you in com- as a companion to the television show outlander if you like our interviews if you like all of the blog articles that we do we, we, you, and you like the news that we do on the on the blog you can do us a favor and tell people that we exist. Tell them that Outlander exists. Tell them that Stars exists. And that way, we as, an, as a, a podcast can get the recognition that we need and the show can get the recognition it deserves. So that is, those are the ways that you can help Outlander cast. Another great way is to head on over to iTunes and to leave us a rating or a review. We currently have 183 Whoa. ratings on iTunes. I challenge you, Outlander cast listeners, head on over. Let's get that to 200 by the end of 2015. Oh, 200. that's a hundred. That's a big number. That is, it is. So I'm asking for 17 of you to go and rate and review this show. So now, if you leave a written review, yep. our 200th listener, our 200th reviewer is going to get a prize from the Marion Blake store. Oh, hey, you know what? Let's even do this too. 190 gets a prize too. Okay. That's 190 very nice. 190 gets a prize and 200 gets a prize from the Marion Blake store. Anything your heart desires, whether it's a Sassanock wasted t-shirt or I survived Droughtlander and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. <laughs> You can do that, and you'll be able to get that there. So please go check that out at the Marion Blake store. And the final last thing I want you to do is, go again, I mentioned this before, go to the blog at outlandercast.com, where you'll be able to find all of Outlander latest news, casting, everything. It's all there. Any theories and ideas, it's all written by our wonderful writers that I mentioned earlier on in this episode. (sighs) Go to the Outlandercast blog. It it rules. It really does. And the most important part is that it's written by the fans. I don't I don't really write anything. I mean, I read that letter. I mean, I wrote the letter, but it's written by you guys for you guys. So that's what's most important about it. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mary Larson. My name's Blake. And you've been listening to Outlander Cast. <laughs>